I'm Catherine Arndt, the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. Welcome to today's episode, brought to you by the VLGA, your councillor support network and the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hi everyone, welcome to VLGA Connect. It's time for another edition in our Operation Sandon series. We've been talking to people in and around the sector for a few weeks now about the various recommendations that have come from the Operation Sandon report after the IBAC inquiry. And while we still wait on a definitive response from the government, we'd like to explore some of the themes that perhaps we haven't covered too much to date. And we'll get to the recommendations that impact on the CEO employment relationship in just a moment with our guest today. I'm going to bring in Catherine Arndt today, the CEO of the VLGA, to join me for this discussion. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Chris. How are you? Well, thank you. And lovely to see you and have you here for our conversation with Professor Roberta Ryan from the University of Newcastle. Roberta, hello and welcome. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. As you mentioned, Chris, this is uh, episode four in our Operation Sandon series, and we're really pleased to have uh, Roberta here with us today to just, as you said, explore some of those um, or, or have some of those conversations that perhaps we haven't yet got to and, and hear some additional perspective on the 34 recommendations that are within the Operation Sandon report, and in particular, uh, the planning review panels and also the CEO employment relationship matters. So, Chris, over to you. So I might just explain uh, Roberta's background. Roberta is a professor of local government at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales. She's a director of the Institute for Regional Futures, which focuses on strengthening the capacity of regions in Australia and internationally. That's another topic that we could spend some time on. And uh, Roberta was formerly the inaugural director of the Institute for Public Policy and Governance at UTS, a director of the Centre for Local Government and at the Australian Centre of Excellence for Local Government. Roberta, can we perhaps uh, honestly say you're a local government tragic like the rest of us? Absolute tragic. I know there's, there's a limited number of us, but we're all keen, those of us that are the local government tragics. Indeed. And uh, you were one of the people called on to provide some expert evidence at Operation Sandon on a, on a number of areas. Before we get to the CEO stuff, can we perhaps close the loop a little on the planning panel framework? Because I know you would have liked to join us for our panel discussion a few weeks ago, but were unable. Really keen to get your take on how that framework has worked in New South Wales. And I guess, what would you say to Victoria in starting down that path about perhaps pitfalls and things to be mindful of? Yeah, look, I, I was involved in um, supporting the implementation of the initial local planning panels um, and then did an evaluation of them after they're up and running a bit. Um, I think whilst there was a, there was a fair bit of uh, discussion about the consequences of planning decisions being taken away from councillors and there was a kind of political discussion around that for obvious reasons. Um, I think the important point to make about how local planning panels work is that councils and local democracy and council uh, continues to make the key decisions which are the rezonings, which is where you decide what the land uses are in a local government area. Um, so, you know, that's where uh, decisions are made as to, you know, whether we're going to have density here or parks here or commercial here or what the centres are going to be. And that work is in New South Wales is still predominantly undertaken by uh, local councils through their local environmental plans, their LEPs. So councillors still do control the principal levers that determine the character and the future land uses of the local government areas in which uh, over which they preside. What is different about the planning panels is that the decisions, uh, when a development application comes in, uh, the councillors don't make the assessment against those rules. So in my view, that's a good thing because the councillors have set the rules, they've determined on behalf of their communities what this place is going to be like, a development application comes in and a different body determines whether that DA aligns with those rules or doesn't. Hmm. And that's the principal role of the local planning panels. And of course, New South Wales has regional planning panels. They operate similar, pretty similarly. It's just a value difference in terms of the scale and scope of the development. R Roberta, what do, what do you say, though, to those councillors that perhaps got into being a councillor in the first place because they, they want to be involved in those on-the-ground decisions that can be so emotive in communities? 
Yeah, look, it is. There's a, one of the things I enjoy doing is asking every time I met a counsellor, why did you decide to be a counsellor? Mm. Um, what got you there? And um, and I've asked that question of a lot of counsellors over the years. And look, there's there's often a group of people who are there because they've had they've been involved in a planning dispute, local planning dispute, and they've thought, oh, look, you know, that decision should have gone differently, or I don't understand how we how we ended up where we did, particularly if. Uh, you know, um, from a community action group point of view, things didn't go the way they'd like. So there there are often councillors who've got on to council because they've got a view about the planning system and how it works and they'd like to have a say because they want to represent their communities. And, of course, what they discover is that it's a very complicated system. Uh, there's a lot of decision points. There's a lot of required expertise all the way through from, you know, there's been the kind of implications of climate change and flooding and coastal inundation all the way things through to things like heritage contamination and so on. And so um, no one councillor or no one group of councils indeed can, um, you know, have the required expertise. So they have to rely heavily on the staff, which they should. They're the experts who provide them with that kind of information. So even in that rezoning process or changing the land use process, it is a very complex and technical um, you know, process, but it is the role of the councillors to sort of set the values around um, what this area should look like. And if if the more people understand how these processes work, and I think this is pretty universally true, the more that they can understand why, you know, density around, around transport is a good idea. And, you know, yes, we want to preserve the low rise nature of this particular suburb. It's, it's all, and you know, and that we don't want to set planning controls that lock out future generations. We don't want to have planning controls where um, you, your sons and your, your kids can't live in your neighbourhood because they can't afford it. Um, so the more we can educate the decision makers, the better those outcomes are going to be. And Roberta, clearly that education also needs to happen at the voter level also. So these conversations, I think, are really important to assist educating you know some of our viewers who may not be elected representatives but rather interested uh you know ratepayers and and voters so if you were to give victoria any advice at all um having now evaluated and reflected on the new south wales model what would you recommend to this jurisdiction in setting up if it does go down that path planning panels what to avoid um, potentially and, and what to embrace? I think my view uh, is, and I sit on a regional planning panel and I've sat on a number of regional planning panels, so I should I should say that. So I think I've had a kind of insider's view as well as an outsider's view. I think that local communities and local councillors ought to retain the uh, what I'd call the strategic planning piece. They ought to retain determining um, what should happen in their local areas. And uh, in response to your point, Catherine, about communities, um, there's a view that it's too complex to involve communities in strategic planning. In other words, saying, you know, let's have density here or, you know, let's make sure this is the kind of open space we have here, those kinds of higher order decisions. And, and I don't believe that's true. Plenty of councils work very effectively with their communities in, in informing them about how to set those uh, strategic planning principles and guidelines and then what happens is and we've done some work on this um, and again evaluated some of this in New South Wales when you involve the community as well as the council is in that when a development applicant when a DA comes in you know when a particular proposal comes in it goes through the system much more quickly because the community and the developers understand what's expected in this particular locality so I think it's really important to build the capacity of councils and communities in that strategic planning piece um, and for the most part as I said in New South Wales they uh, they control that local environmental planning there are priority precincts where large projects and so on where the state government does the rezoning um, that they, they, they are the exception rather than the rule then I think what's of benefit um, and what I think has worked well and I think you can overplay the expertise part so there's, a, there's been an argument that says, look, what you want to do is put experts, uh, planners or architects or urban designers, or in my case, people who uh, might be referred to as social planners, on these planning panels because that expertise will elevate the quality of the decisions. I think what councillors have is expertise about their place, 
about their community. And I think local expertise ought to be valued. And one of the things that um, the New South Wales did was to say, generally there's five people, um, you know, it can vary a bit, but generally there's five people. Three might be so-called experts um, and two need to be community people and have a demonstrated understanding, appreciation and connection with their community. I think that's a really useful thing where you're saying I, we value local expertise and it's real expertise and they know, oh, that look, it might not show it on the plans, but every time when the wind comes from this direction, this will happen or it floods here. A lot of that stuff, you know, a lot of the mapping and so on is often out of date. That fine-grained, granular information or knowledge that local people have is unbelievably useful in these assessment processes. So I think retaining that's important. What has happened subsequently after the sort of first iteration at the regional planning panel level was that councillors who were previously prohibited um, from applying to sit and be appointed um, was, and there was a whole controversy about who determined who was eligible and whose list you picked off it, without getting into all of that detail. Um, and now, now councillors can be that local expert. Um, now, there's pros and cons about that. What I find uh, happens is that councillors, because they've been in, they've been involved in the setting of the rules, they often have to declare an interest and they're not available, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. um, but likewise, um, we have experts, planners particularly, who belong to large consulting firms who often find themselves conflicted, not because they've worked on a particular project, but because one of their colleagues have. So th this, this conflict of interest question can be quite difficult to manage. Um, and so there are ways to select people for planning panels that I think doesn't overplay the expertise piece, but plays into a discussion about a diversity of views around the table, which is good for decision making. I mean, Victoria has within its Local Government Act um, a requirement for councils to engage in deliberative democracy, uh, participatory democracy. So I, I guess for some of those who are suggesting that, um, you know, some of the reforms mentioned in Sandon might reduce the um, community input into um, into planning matters and how their um, community might look and feel, should feel a little reassured that, in fact, within the legislation, there are there is that requirement for that cons consultation to be happening, as you say, around that more high level strategic um, planning matter. Yeah, and I, and I do think that's that's the sort of nub of local government. You know, um, it ought to reflect the aspirations of the people who live there, um, whether they're councillors or community. But the count the community and the councillors, and that's the notion of the of the deliberative democracy. It's not just ask what people want, that's not what you do. You educate and inform people about the consequences of particular decision-making. Um, you know, if you don't make, uh, if, if, if everything's, um, you know, a quarter acre block suburban home, you don't provide housing for a diverse community and diverse communities are better places to live, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the notion of, um, you know, you don't just go out and say, well, what do I want? Because the people who currently have the vested interests are the people who get the most say. There's plenty of ways to manage those issues. And there's plenty of ways to do it through educated uh, engagement, through good representation and so on. So I'm a big fan of that, but I do think the fundamental issue around why it's a better system in terms of um, probity and anti-corruption, um, which was the first criteria for the establishment of local planning panels was to assist with uh, the management of corruption, is because, and, and um, we were saying before, I, I disagree with um, some of the discussion that happened in the earlier panel, because planning panels are different from councillors. My appointment to a planning panel is made for a three-year appointment. Um, we are rotated, so I don't know from one week to the next if I'm going to be on a ma on this matter or this matter. So the capacity for somebody to, so say somebody rings me up and says, oh, Roberta, you're on the panel for, well, firstly, they don't know um, until the day. Secondly, um, I have to declare it, of course, and then, you know, I'm, you know, I'm cycled out of that one, if, if, even if it happened accidentally that somebody rang me up. Um, so there's, of course, there's very tight rules around that. But I, my 
the ongoing nature of my role, i.e. being an elected councillor, doesn't depend upon what decision I make. I think it's a fundamentally different set of rules here. Mm. So and it's not because I'm an expert. I think we can, over, as I said before, I think we can overplay the expert or so-called expert. Um, I think it's about diversity of views. I think it, local expertise needs to be in there. Yep, planning expertise is important, of course, of course, all those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, councillors can be planners too or they can have a lot of local expertise. The issue is that I don't, the consequences of me um, approving or not a development application are quite different from the consequences and the reasons, even if it's not a direct pecuniary interest or it's about carrying favour. You know, I know that there's a group of people here who'd like to see that development proceed. This, it has no, there are no, there's no possible consequences either way for me, whether um, as a member of a panel, um, as to whether an approval occurs or not. Um, and so there's a lot of ways you can you can monitor the system as well. So, um, you know, we, the, the Department of Planning in New South Wales monitors because we get recommendations, the councils make a recommendation to us. So the officers largely, it look, it can vary, it can be a state matter, but largely the council staff make a recommendation. And if a panel uh, goes against, doesn't endorse that recommendation, you know, you've got to have reasons and so on. And, and like with, you know, you've got VCAT, we've got the New South Wales Environment, um, you know, uh, Land and Environment Court, you know, there's a, there's an there's an arbiter, if at all, you know, everyone disagrees at the end. Um, but we, we've got a whole lot of information that says, you know, fewer matters will go, um, you know, will go to the, to your, you know, to VCAT and so on, because at the moment, I think there's a view that VCAT is setting policy, um, planning policy in Victoria because so many decisions get flicked out mm -hmm. of the system because they, they're difficult to resolve at a council level. So that doesn't mean that doesn't happen in New South Wales, but um, we either which way, whether we endorse a recommendation from council or or, or don't, um, all of this is all of this is monitored. You know, so if if a particular planning panel suddenly decided they were going to disagree with every recommendation that came up from council, um, that'd be picked up pretty quickly in the system mm -hmm. as well. So there's there's systematic ways to address this this issue as well. Roberta, I think, and Catherine, that's been a really useful addition to the conversation we've been having about the potential planning reforms that might flow from Operation Sandon. Roberta, I want to look at another piece that you uh, certainly gave some evidence on to Operation Sandon, and it, it's come out in some of the recommendations to change the way the CEO employment relationship is managed, particularly around uh, the uh, the assessment of performance as, as well as recruitment. Um in terms of the Operation Sand and aim of dealing with fraud and corruption and preventing same, why would this be a relevant matter, do you think? Because I think um, the way that the relationship currently exists between CEOs and particularly mayors, but councillors in general, is that the CEO's the only direct employee of the council and their employment is dependent upon uh, their continued good relationship um, with the mayor, particularly, but with the councillors as well. Now, very few of us, I can't really think of another example. It might be, you know, ministerial staffers and so on, but, you know, in the kind of regular workforce that most of us work in, we don't have that kind of um, dependency. Um, so I think what occurs, what can occur is that it's very difficult uh, to call out the bad behaviour of councillors or identify or try to follow up on something where you might be, a CEO might be concerned about corrupt conduct or even process and systems issues that don't work well. Um, if that is resisted by the council or the councillors, um, that can be a very challenging thing to do. So the current set of arrangements potentially might, might make CEOs feel that they can't bring to the surface and act early on potential issues that could lead to corrupt conduct or could be bad processes or bad decision-making processes because of the nature of the dependency of the relationship. So I think it's a very helpful thing if, again, we're really clear about who sets the rules here so that um, the, the appointment of a CEO 
um, of course, should be something that the councillors have a significant role in because they want to uh, reflect the values and aspirations of their organisation um, within, you know, in that appointment. Um, but it needs to be done in such a way, in my view, that, you know, you, you take into account the, you know, whether it's the big P political or even the kind of um, range of factions and views that exist on councils, that you... Um, that it's a broadly supported position. The minute you have a CEO who's appointed who only half the council support, um, you're really asking that person to work with one hand behind their back. Um, whereas that that should be avoided from the, on, from the onset. So there needs to be, in my view, again, some external expertise to support this process, um, some uh, uh, broader range of views. This is a not just an expensive appointment, but it's the most probably the most critical, one of the most critical things councillors will do in their term. I was talking to a group of councillors on Friday night at a charity event who were saying to me, do you think we could, I was on the recruitment panel, do you think we did, we, you know, we picked so and so and I said, yeah, you've done a great job there. But they worry about whether they've got the the right background or expertise because they may not, they may not have ever been they may not have ever participated in this. So we we don't want to enhance, we don't want to have councillors in control of something when we don't give them and support them with the relevant capability to be doing this because uh, because you get bad outcomes. Mm. Um, now, of course, some will have, it's like in planning, some will have the expertise, some won't, but they need to be supported with expert capability to set clear criteria, uh, to set uh, criteria against which you can easily collectively agree as to whether the performance of the person has achieved against that criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a point around how um, CEOs are appointed, and then I think there's a point around how their um, how their performance is reviewed subsequently. Roberta, just before we go into that, and I know you did give evidence on that very point um, during the Operation Sand and Investigation, but just going back to some of your reflections around the CEO employment relationship, it reminded me of a story I heard recently in Victoria where a CEO of a council was um, going through their CEO performance review, but was having to actually support and counsel the mayor through that process because that mayor was extremely stressed and nervous about leading a performance review process of a CEO because they had never been involved in that. So, you know, there's an example of, I mean, what a tricky situation to be in when you are the CEO subject to that review, but having to support uh, a person who was actually feeling very stressed about it. So I thought that was a, a good example to highlight just some of the things you were talking about there. But perhaps you could go into a little bit more detail about CEO performance reviews and uh, delegating that to a panel and, you know, what would be the advantages of this approach um, and how could it contribute to preventing inappropriate CEO, CEO behaviour yeah. or dismissal? It's 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 trying to get the balance right on both sides, isn't it? You want to have councillors um, making appointments that reflect their organisations and their values, um, but you need a relationship you know, it's the, it's the principal relationship that drives what happens in a council. Um, and if it becomes dysfunctional because for whatever reason, whether it's a personality thing or it's a political thing, or um, it, it's incredibly difficult to resolve this. So in terms of the, how the appointment's done is critical so that the um, what success looks like here is, is well-defined and measurable. And then at the point where the performance review is um, conducted, that there is um, uh, there are some outside experts who can assist councillors with making assessments against the criteria that has previously been set, and they can be supported and guided um, in that process because um, because it can be a very tough process. It's tough giving anybody positive or negative feedback. You work every day with somebody. Um, it's it's a process where the relationship is not. Uh, is critical, and the success um, uh, of that relationship really determines. It's it's a it's a critical factor in just determining the performance success of the council. With respect to the corruption potential, it's incredibly difficult for a CEO to call out the behaviour, um, or or 
uh, suspect or address uh, potential corrupt behaviour of councils, the councillors, and um, in doing that, um, they will risk their employment under the current arrangements. Um, because if if count if a mayor or a councillor is determined to break the rules or do the wrong thing, and a CEO wants to get in the way of that, it's going to be very difficult for that person to be reappointed. So um, I'm sure we all know many examples of, of CEOs who've done it because it's the right thing to do at enormous personal cost. Well, yeah. it's it's analogous to the whistleblower problem that people who want who are wanting to draw attention to potential problems need protection um, within the system and the current employment relationships as they exist in Victoria don't don't afford CEOs adequate protection um, in calling that out. So, Roberta, at the moment, most councils would have an independent in the in the process. Uh, Operation Sandon is recommending to take that further with a majority of independents on a panel and that those committees would become um, determinative rather than just advisory. Um, the former point aligns with current audit and risk committee arrangements. The latter point takes it much further. What's your view on those steps? And has anyone else gone that far that you're aware of? I'm not aware of anyone else having gone that far. Um, I do. Look, I think I think it's, it's I, I think it's one of those things that you might want to give a go and see how it works. Um, I'm all for empowering councillors as much as you possibly can um, because ultimately councillors are the ones who are accountable to their communities and that accountability by way of elections. You know, if it doesn't work and they're not delivering, you know, that'll, that'll, test, that'll wash itself through uh, at the local government elections. Nobody else has that level of accountability, no one in the community, and in fact the CEO doesn't have that kind of, no one in the staff has that kind of accountability to the community in the right way. So I think, you know, instinctively I would want to say, you know, again, if it's a it's if it's a five-person thing, I'd want to say three should be councillors, two should be, um, you know, experts or independents. But I can see the argument for three being experts and independents and two being um, counsellors. Obviously, you'd want um, that to be, a, you know, a process where it's conciliated as best it could be, a range of views are heard, you know, there's a collective decision. I'm not saying it always has to be a consensus decision, but at least some kind of majority. Or And, and then if it's not, you know, those views need to be recorded um, and so that that is all known. But I, I, I find that a really tough one and I think it'll be... Um, whatever decisions made by the state government, it would be really something that you'd want to track over time, collect good data on, and really robustly test how durable that is as a decision-making and whether you do get better outcomes. Because um, it is a real, that I think is the, a real tension between councillor control and then accountability, which is where it sits. Um, and again, that expertise and support and assistance with helping councillors with that capability or capacity, I should really say, um, I think that's hard. And, and it would be fair to say that there's actually a, a mixed view amongst the CEOs themselves on, on this these recommendations. Um, there's a cohort that absolutely believe the current model is, is the right model and then there's another side who, for the very reasons you've just outlined, have concerns about it. Um, I guess looking ahead, Roberta, what do you see as the most pressing challenges and opportunities for local government in their efforts to prevent fraud and corruption while effectively serving their communities as that closest level of government to the people? I think looking ahead, the, the issues that we've got to build a culture where it's safe to call things out. Um, we've also got to build cultures where there is or you know there really is that transparency about how and why decisions are made um, and I think we have to enable councillor um, capability to be good decision makers now I know you know you might get a change over half your council might change um, at the next election. So, look, it's, you know, it's like Payne in the Harbour Bridge, as we say here, um, you know, you have to keep doing it. It's not yeah. something you, you sort of set and forget. You have to keep doing it. I worry about 
uh, codes of conduct approach approaches that talk too much to the behavioural elements um, because I think uh, it's 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 kind of focuses things in the wrong place. I think what we have to do is be very um, very relaxed about declaring conflicts. I think uh, whether it's perceived or actual, yeah, you know, it's a it's a routine thing to do. We all need to understand what that what that looks like, what that means. This all needs to be recorded. Um, and, you know, people, can, and often when I'm talking with counsellors, if there's any doubt, step out. You know, that's just, think about that. It doesn't matter. It's, don't make a big deal of it. Um, you know, that trying to build that kind of, um, that kind of ease around understanding how uh, a conflict of interest might be perceived as well as might be actual. It does, you're not, you know, sometimes counsellors feel as if they're declaring a conflict of interest that they're saying, I've got a vested interest in this outcome. That's that's not the case. But because, you know, we're sort of making a big deal of it. Um, so I think it is about empowering, about changing that relationship between the CEO um, and the counsellor group, enabling the CEO to be really robustly able to move into these discussions the state government, you know, needs to be able to support these um, processes and give people proper protections in this space and separate setting the rules from making decisions against the rules. It is whether it's you setting the policy for how community engagement happens in your council or how we determine, you know, assets or whatever it is, the policy is set by the councillors the organisation and the CEO's job is to deliver against that policy. So it, it's, it's, it's the staying in your lane um, it's the being clear about roles and responsibilities and the more we talk about this um, because I think um, you know you see you, you see both sides of this you see CEOs who don't adequately involve counsellors in decisions they ought to be involved in um, because they say oh, we don't want to you know gosh we don't want to start a conversation with them about that we'll just go over here and do it that is not that is not the right way to do things any more than it is to have counsellors um, making decisions that are uh, that are you know, not taking into account the expertise that a, a, a staff, you know, the staff and the team have. So it's it's under, it, I think it's around clarity of the roles and really understanding the importance of the roles that counsellors have, which are making the big decisions, setting the guide rails in which things are done, and the organisation's job is to deliver that. I mean, I, I know there's been discussions and I'm not mad about the analogy between kind of boards and and uh, I mean, there's a whole argument around that, as you know. Um, I don't think it's the same as a board, but but in some respects, it's the clarity of roles um, where the important decisions are made uh, by councils. They are ultimately accountable. It is the roles and responsibilities piece. And then, you know, it's the, it's the role of the organisation to implement those decisions. A few directions we could take that if we had uh, more time, perhaps future conversations. But uh, I'm mindful that clarity uh, word you've used a fair bit. And yes, absolutely, we need to achieve that as we head towards uh, an election cycle. I guess the question is, how do we do that? Perhaps we can come back and talk to you about your thoughts on that at some future point, Roberta. P perhaps one final question from me, though. Um, one thing we are hearing in the wake of Operation Sandon is you know, those councils that are working effectively, those council laws that feel like they do the right thing, as most do, but they're being tarred with this this brush. 34 recommendations feels like, you know, a blunt instrument to deal with the behaviour of a few. How do you respond to that? I, look, I understand that. And, and you know, it's why I every time I meet a councillor, I say, why did, you put, why did you put your hand up? Because you think, gosh, it's pretty thankless. It's long hours. It's not like it's remunerated well. Um, people, 90% of people, probably 99% of councillors do it because they want to make a positive difference in the communities in which they live. Um, and, and it's thankless. So I think what we need to do is, you know, to, to address that um, is, is to really make sure that the councillors do make the important decisions, that their roles are well understood. And we, we, um, provide them with the right uh, support and tools to make those decisions. So what I think we need to do is elevate 
our appreciation and our value of the roles of counsellors, um, not be in this constant conversation about, well, what would they know? They were only a school teacher or they were, yep, they were. And that's, you know, what everyone brings some kind of expertise and um, a range of viewpoints to the table, which is what makes for good decision making. Um, but I think if we can, um, if we can, really better appreciate the contribution that councillors make to their communities, um, do much more talking up around the positive things. Um, I, I remember talking years ago to a very well-known um, mayor um, and, you know, she used to say to me, you know, what I do at the beginning of every term is I ask each councillor, what, what do you want to achieve in this term? And I make it my job to see that they do because they haven't got on there to sit through interminable meetings and read piles of paper yeah. um, and, you know, do lots of um, social events, which I'm sure some of them find deeply tedious, um, to not achieve their objectives. So I think, you know, it sits with CEOs as well as mayors to see that they can achieve those objectives um, you know, within that broader kind of strategic and community planning process as well. So I think we need to really value the role of councillors much more and appreciate the contributions that they make. And, um, but, you know, it's like it's the one corrupt politician that makes them all look bad, whether it's um, at, it, whether it's at state level or at, at local government level or more any level. And I guess to that point, then your question, Chris, as uh, IBAC would say, the Operation Sandham report although there was one council that was subject to, uh, I guess, the original investigation, they have applied a risk assessment approach and have identified systemic risks from their perspective that all 79 councils need to be mindful of. And I, I think that that is um, absolutely, um, I agree with Roberta and was having this conversation today about how we really have to keep talking about the important role and responsibilities that our elected representatives at local government level have. We need to inform the community of those, the voters, so that they are they are casting informed votes when it comes to election time. But we also need to be aware and um, open our eyes to the fact that there are risks that exist with the current system and what are the opportunities that we can increase transparency um, and the robustness of a system so that we don't hear more of uh, a loss of trust at any level of government and in particular local government that we're talking about now. Mm. Yeah, and having said that, um, you know, we do lots of social research and and um, local council, local councillors are still the best, most well regarded of elected people. Uh, in our federated system, and local governments enjoy the highest level of trust. So despite all of these challenges um, that we're hearing, and you know, in every jurisdiction we're hearing about it and other levels of government too, but despite all of that, um, councils way and above uh, are considered by the community um, as a whole as being more trustworthy than other levels of government. Roberta, thank you. I think we we probably should leave it there. Uh, we really appreciate your considered thank insights you. and your uh, generosity of time today. We've been speaking with Roberta Ryan, Professor of Local Government, uh, Local Government at the University of Newcastle in New South Wales. Thanks so much for being part of VLGA Connect, Roberta. Thanks for the opportunity. It was great to talk with you both. And Catherine Arndt, CEO of the VLGA, good to have you join me on today's special edition as part of our Operation Sandin series, Catherine. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Roberta. That's been terrific. That's our program for today. Thank you for watching and listening, and stay tuned with more to come from VLGA Connect. Bye for now.